Hello, my name is Brian Wargo, and I'm the Eastern Flyway Editor for Hawk Migration Studies, which is the publication for the Hawk Migration Association of North America, where I serve as the chair of the Data Committee. I also serve as the chair for the Education and Conservation Committee there. Uh, I'm also a counter, a hawk counter, at the Allegheny Front Hawk Watch, and I count there each Saturday. Uh, this session is really to give you an idea of how the uh, flyway report is written and the process and methodology that I go about using. One of the things that we'll notice is I have a picture here and it appears to be a golden eagle with a porcupine quill either in his mouth or maybe in his nostril. It appears that the membrane is still over his eye. Some of these particular sightings do not get uh, included into our Eastern Flyway reports, but they exist. The Flyway report is more of a zoomed out version of the totality of the migration. When we talk about the Eastern Flyway, we're really talking about this big um, massive swath of the United States going from, actually it goes into Canada down towards Georgia and Alabama. The uh, tip of Florida is a different flyway, as are the Great Lakes. In the spring, that circle will become a little bit smaller. And so we have 23 sites that have reported in the spring of 2020, even despite having COVID pandemic and working around that, 23 sites have still been able to report data. And we reach from Maine down to Virginia. Remember, all of our birds are coming uh, north, um, towards the north in the spring. Many of them will follow these ridges right along, actually many through Pennsylvania and up north. Some of our birds like to migrate along the coast here. Out of our 23 sites, seven of them are from Pennsylvania, four from New Jersey, three from New York, two from Massachusetts, two from Maine, two from Virginia, and one site from Connecticut, Maryland, and New Hampshire. This massive block of information is really the totality of the migration. This shows every site that has collected data, all 23 sites in the Eastern Flyway for the spring of 2020. And I'd like to explain how to read this. First of all, you'll notice columns going down this is the number of observation hours reported to hawkcount.org. And you also notice some are red and some are green. The red right here for Scotts Mountain, it's a deep red, shows that they had the fewest reported hours of the 23 sites. Where if we look at uh, Fort Smallwood, they have 436 and a quarter hours. And that's the most. So they're the darkest green. The shade shows the rank. One of the other things that I'd like to point out is often it's just too hard to look at the entire flyway because of its geographic range being so large. Um, sometimes we like to break them into smaller sampled sites, um, regions, if you will. So if you look at the first three that I have blocked together, we've got the Allegheny Front, Hawk Mountain, and Tussie Mountain. And this big giant block is really going to show us the ridge sites of Pennsylvania. And notice each one of these sites has over 300 hours. 344 for Allegheny Front, 301 for Hawk Mountain, and Tussie has 416. They're going to give us a nice sampling of what's happening in the ridge sites. We don't have every site listed in that sample, but there's a reason for that. Allegheny Front often doesn't get, well, almost never gets the same birds as Tussie Mountain. They're going to be uh, flying on one ridge or the other. So they kind of complement one another. When we add these three sites together, we really get a nice picture uh, of what's going on for the ridge sites. We'll do the same for Bradbury Mountain and Plum Island for the northeastern region of the Eastern Flyway. And I also want to point something out here. Um, You'll notice that Bradbury is going to be at 406 hours and Plum Island is 157. Quite a difference. We normally have Pilgrim um, Hawksite also 
in this particular sample, but they didn't collect data in 2020. One of the uh, things that is going to happen when you have a disparity of hours here is our numbers are going to be heavily leaning towards Bradbury. But if you look at our species, and I'll go through them all quickly, uh, we have our black vultures, turkey vulture, osprey, bald eagle, northern harrier, sharp shin hawks, cooper's hawks, northern goshawk, a red shouldered, broad wing hawks, red tail hawks, rough legged, golden eagles, American kestrel, merlins, peregrines, and then the total for each site. So if we look at Bradbury's number, uh, 5,057 total birds versus the Plum Island total of 11 or um, 1,102 birds, we can see that Bradbury, their values are going to uh, almost overwhelm Plum Island. But um, because they are almost forming a complementary pair themselves, you can see the American Kestrel and Merlin numbers from Plum Island is going to help balance out some of the um, other numbers from Bradbury Mountain. So we have two sites in that sample. And then for the Mid-Atlantic coastal sites, we'll have College Creek, Fort Smallwood, and Montclair. And that will give us three samples. And each one of these sites um, was chosen because they have contiguous data that is reliable and steady and of high number. For instance, the three sites for the ridges have 20 years of data that can be analyzed. Where when we have the northeastern sites, the northeastern sites, we're going to have 13 years that we can use between these two sites. And for the uh, mid-Atlantic coastal sites, we'll have 15 seasons uh, of contiguous data that we can look at. While these other sites listed below here are not part of those samples, they're an important contribution. So I will certainly look at the totality of the birds reported. For instance, on this graphic, we have um, it displayed as 4,126 total hours counted from the sites. I might be blocked over here because of my face in this bottom corner, but it also gives the total number of raptors counted in 2020 for the Eastern Flyway at 34,370. We'll remember that as about 35,000. Clearly, the sites are not distributing these equally. If they did, we would say that 179 hours was average for the 23 sites and about 1,500 birds. Clearly, that's not the case. So averages uh, for the entire flyway are not going to pick out the general trends. Hence the reason for our sampling for the ridge sites, the uh, northeast sites, and the coastal sites. We also have totals at the bottom of each one of these columns for every species. So if we were to look at uh, the total number of peregrine falcons, maybe I shouldn't choose that one because my face is blocking it. If we looked at the total number of ospreys in the entire eastern flyway, it would be 1,800. And we can see that Bradbury had 401, which was the record for 2020. Looking at the entire Eastern Flyway, we can see out of the 35,000 birds, about almost 13,000 of those are turkey vultures, which makes up about 37.5% of the total count. Broadwings are about 10,000 and make up about 30% of the count. Sharpshins are about 8% and make up nearly 3,000 of those birds. Ospreys, 1,800, which makes up about 5%. Redtails are going to be about 4%. Kestrels, a little less than 4%. Black vultures, about 3%. Bald eagles, a little bit more than 2.5% of the total count. Coopers, hawks, about 2% red shoulders, about 1.5. These birds over here are going to be less than 1%. So Merlins make up about uh, a little under 1% of the total count with 338 birds. Northern Harrier, about 0.85. Golden Eagles, 235 were counted in the entire flyway. 
make up about 0.7%. Peregrines, we only have 48. Northern Gossok, 9 total, which makes up 0.03%. And we have not counted a single rough-legged hawk in the entire eastern flyway this spring. It should also be noted that we counted uh, some Mississippi kites. I think there are a total of uh, 23 Mississippi kites that were counted, which is greater than the total number of northern goshawks. But very few sites are getting Mississippi kites, so we don't normally include them in the overall presentation here. Taking eight sites for the total sample of the Eastern Flyway is what is needed to compare each year. So here I have eight sites, and we had um, the three ridge sites, Allegheny Front, Tussie Mountain, and Hawk Mountain. We also had the uh, northeast sites, Bradbury and Plum, and then we had the three sampled sites of um, Fort Smallwood, uh, Montclair and College Creek and those eight sites are giving us really consistent data over what we're doing is 12 years here because when I looked at all the sites we could rely on those sites giving consistent data for 12 years and so I've added all of those together it's kind of like an overall sample for the Eastern Flyway these are not the totals for the Eastern Flyway but the totals for those eight sites so in 2020, if we looked at those eight sites, there's a total of 2590 uh, hours with a total of 25,109 raptors counted. We can also use our color coding again, and you can see that this 1,786 uh, vultures for this particular sample shows that it is the second highest in the last 12 years. Osprey are down dramatically. Um, you'll notice that we're at 1210. When I say dramatically, for Osprey, understand that this is going to show the average number over the last 12 years. Notice 2020 to 2009 for all the eight sites added together. On average, we would have 1499 Osprey. 12-10 is down about 19% or only 81% of a standard average season. That may seem like a lot, but 19% um, is not that great of a dip, even though it's a new record low. A species that we're very concerned about this year is Northern Harrier. And you'll notice that there has been a slow, steady decrease in Harriers over the years. And now they've dropped off about 45% just from last year, um, and we're down about 44% from the average, the 12-year average, with 235 Northern Harrier. That is a very, very scary drop, and something that these trends will allow us to um, be warned that there could be a problem. If we look at some of the other species, we can see that Broadwings, which vary year to year. We all know that they depend on, um, our sites depend on having the right weather and wind conditions for that day to be able to get the flight. So they're going to vary and fluctuate um, substantially. Northern Gossock, on the other hand, notice year after year appears to be, at least for the last seven years, appears to be decreasing. So we don't see any green here. Um, and you can look at each and every species, and we can see our bald eagles are, are clearly uh, on the rise. Um, uh, I can't go back, unfortunately, but that's okay. Uh, this graphic down here, we'll start with bald eagles. I have a graph made for every species for this 12-year, um, eight-site sample. Since we are talking about bald eagles, let's take a look at them and explain each one of these graphs. For bald eagles, we will have a nice steady rise of our bald eagles to our record number for this particular sample. This also gives an R squared value of 0.86. An R squared value is called the correlation coefficient. And when it's at one, 
that means the data corresponds with a perfect linear fit. So while these bald eagle numbers do have a little bit of variation from year to year, they have a nice steady rise. And bald eagles are one of the great conservation wins. Um, so one of the success stories, if you will. We wanted to save the bald eagle, the American eagle, if you will. And we put uh, some regulations in place, some laws that you're not allowed to shoot them or poison them. And uh, lo and behold, their numbers go up. Turkey vultures are also going up. But the conservation movement, most people weren't as concerned about a turkey vulture. But the vulture numbers are going up. They fluctuate much more. And vulture numbers are a tricky one. And uh, we'll see with the ridge sites later on. Sometimes we're not sure if they're migrating because they'll fly north and come back south in the same day. So we have to always temper our, um, our overall claims with uh, some context. Let's go and look at for our uh, 12 or for our eight sites over the last 12 years, we can see the numbers are really consistent for our observation hours. We know that some um, uh, some years are, are going to have better weather than others, but overall this is rock steady observation hours. We can also see our total number of birds fluctuates a bit year to year, but that's the beauty of the sample. It can kind of temper those. And uh, I would say those are also nice and steady. And you can see our, our line of best fit here is going to be uh, fairly straight and showing that there is no real pattern with the correlation coefficient. Um, our golden eagles uh, appear to be going down almost steeply. But again, a little bit of context here. Not all of our sites are going to be, um, you know, uh, counting eagle, golden eagles. They, they just don't get them at their sites. Uh, black vultures appear to be fairly steady. And let's go on to some other species for our eight site 12 year sample. Osprey uh, appear to be undulating up and down, up and down, up and down. A little bit of a slight decrease here. But notice our northern harrier have um, like a significant drop off right here. And I should probably point out what these little indicating lines, these little tick marks are. This middle tick mark, if you can see them, there's a tick mark right there. That is going to be the average. Each tick mark below that is a standard deviation. So this would be one standard deviation. This would be a second standard deviation. And you'll notice that our northern Harris, for at least this sample, um, which is a representative of the Eastern Flyway, is two standard deviations from our average. Now, statisticians will say that if you have uh, two and a half standard deviations, we normally call that an outlier. I don't like calling this an outlier because unlike random events, um, this might be showing there's a problem with Northern Harriers. And uh, I think it's Lori Goodrich from Hawk Mountain has, with others, an article that just came out about the Harrier uh, life cycle that might help explain some of these crashes. Regardless, this is something that uh, we would certainly want to be very concerned about. We can also see uh, our broad wings are going to end up fluctuating year to year. And our red tail, on the other hand, seem to have a really steep decrease here, correlation coefficient of 0.624. This is a problem that we've been aware of. Hawk Migration Studies has an article, an issue or two back, from Nick Bolgiano, who um, documents the short stopping of red tail hawks. They probably are just not flying as far south. They're able to uh, stay north over the uh, season. And that, uh, for context, appears to indicate that some of our climate uh, changes might be um, related to this. Red-shouldered hawks also appear to be decreasing slightly, but rough-legged. You also notice that we have so few rough-legged hawks that it's hard to say much about them other than we're at zero this year. It's happened before in 2016.
are sharp shins. We've been concerned about sharp shins for a few years now, and they are making a, uh, a pattern that is showing a decrease. And what you'll notice is they undulate from year to year, up and down, up and down, up and down. But that undulation seems to have a negative trend, much like with our Cooper's hawk. We can see this undulation, but it is constantly decreasing. And you'll notice our correlation coefficient of 0.67 shows that uh, that's a significant um, trend. Also, if we use our y equals mx plus b, this can tell us, this number right here can tell us how many fewer birds we would expect each year according to this trend. Northern goshawk, if this trend were to keep up, we would see that we would probably not have northern goshawk in the eastern flyway in a few years. Again, if we forecasted from this trend, we have to be careful forecasting, but northern goshawk are a species that also appear uh, to be explained by climate change. Kestrels are decreasing and have been for some time. They've been on our radar for a while, and we'll see this in the other regions. It almost appears that they've settled into a much uh, less numerous steady state here. Merlins, in general, seem to be fairly stable and possibly increasing from one region to the next. Peregrine falcons are undulating up and down, but uh, not much of a correlation coefficient. We can now look at each individual region. So here I have the three sites from the ridges, the Allegheny Front Hawk Watch, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, and Tussie Mountain. And looking at these three sites, we've got 20 years of reliable data, high numbers of observation hours. So this is a really good sample. We'll also notice that we have two greens in a row, which means our peregrine falcon numbers um, are tying for the highest for this particular region. Bald eagle numbers are at about the second highest. Uh, again, not a single northern goshawk. This is the first year for the ridge sites not to have a northern goshawk recorded. Rough-legged does not have any recording. It happened one other time. We can look and see that Merlin's, it says 20 uh, for this season, and that's down a little bit from the previous season, but it appears to be um, one like 29 percent higher than an average year. Our observation hours are about average. You'll notice that uh, 104 percent, 100 percent means they're average, um, and uh, those will certainly fluctuate. But notice, and we've seen it graphically, that um, those fluctuations might not be as great as they first appear. Sometimes it's easier just to look at the graphs, but I do want to point out that we have uh, 2001 has a pretty high year for many species, and we'll come back to that. Oh, one other um, thing that we want to uh, point out for the ridge sites is black vultures and turkey vultures, and you'll notice that their percentages are really um, almost frightening when you see 37%, but black vultures are one of these species that is slowly increasing its range, and often at our sites, when they're um, coming to our site, they're not going past our site, so often we don't count them because we're only counting migrating uh, vultures. And again, I've mentioned the turkey vultures. Uh, a lot of sites are just frustrated, and we're not sure if we should be counting them um, we have different dates that we've set up. So while this uh, number of turkey vultures appears to be a bit lower, uh, I don't think that's something that is of grave concern at this point um, because of the context of knowing that our turkey vultures are a difficult species to tell if they're migrating or if they're staying local. Let's go and look at uh, the ridge sites overall. And our sample shows that our broadwing hawks make up about 45% of the total birds counted at the ridge sites. Red tails, 12.5%. Turkey vultures, closer to 9%. Osprey at about 7%. Sharpshin a little less than 7 
Golden Eagles, about 6% of the total count, which is higher than our bald eagles. Um, for the spring, and again, these are all for spring. Spring and fall can be very different. Um, Cooper's hawk, and kestrels, a little bit above 2%. Red shoulders, a little bit below. And again, um, we don't have a single uh, rough-legged or northern goshawk for the ridge sites. A first. And peregrines make up a small percentage, 0.37%. One of the things that I wanted to talk about is how we can sample. You can sample by totals or you can sample by percentages. And let me explain that. So when we're looking at the Allegheny Front, Tussie Mountain, and Hawk Mountain, we might look at the total number of birds, which I've done in the other graphics. I've added all of the birds together for each site. And then we can take that for the last 20 years, adding all three sites together. And that's how we can get our percent difference for um, 2020 compared to the average. We can also look, if we wanted, to the percent difference from each site. And then we could average those percent differences from the sites together. That might sound a little bit confusing, but anyone who's ever done this kind of work realizes you kind of have to pick one or the other. And I'll show you an example of this um, that might help us understand why the differences can be so great. You'll notice that if we look at our peregrine falcons, um, and maybe we should go to our next, next graphic. So look for our, let's, let's look at bald eagles real quick. 77% difference, where before our other um, illustration showed it was an 86% difference. I'll just go to this graphing and show you what I'm talking about here. For bald eagles, you might notice that if we looked at the average percent of the averages, so in other words, what is the change for Allegheny Front, their percentage, and then the percentage for Hawk Mountain, and then the percentage for Tussie Mountain, that is going to be different than if we added all of the bald eagles up for the three sites. And we did that for all 20 years and then looked at the difference. And that's what this difference is showing. 77% versus 86%. Depending on how you're um, looking at these uh, values. In the graphics that I showed earlier, I'm using the average of the totals. In other words, we're totaling all of the birds together and then we're looking at the differences between years. And most of the time, it's not a big difference at all. Like Osprey, both methods are very close. Um, even the observation hours, you know. So often when we're writing these reports for the flyway report, we would say about 105%. Or I might say the total hours percentage of 104 hours. Okay, You can see that little bit of difference um, often is not enough to make a big uh, issue of. Northern Harrier, you'll notice that both methods are going to show that there's about a 40%, 38% or 40% drop in the Harriers for 2020. Um, but most of them are pretty close. Most of them are pretty close. But you might notice, um, like for our Merlins, they're exact. Look at Peregrine Falcons here, and there's a huge difference between these two. Why is that? Well, this disparity is because, first of all, peregrine falcons are counted in rather small numbers at the ridge sites. And that Tussie, let me go to the next graph, Tussie Mountain did not count a single peregrine falcon this year, where Allegheny Front had a very high count. So the disparity of this is going to be great because um, Tussie Mountain is going to show a great percentage difference but maybe they only get a few peregrines every year. So percentages can sometimes make the changes look drastic. And that's why often when we use the total numbers, we can get a better feel for the overall trends. And that's what's happened here. So when I'm writing up these reports, I will either talk about the percentage difference or the total number difference. I hope that's not confusing. When we look at the three ridge sites sampled, again, we've got 20 years or 20 spring seasons to look at. You'll notice that if we look at the breakdown by species, 
our broadwing hawks make up about 46% of our total count. Now, on an average year, that would be 32%, 33%. So instead of being a third, we're closer to a half of the total count being made up of broadwings. That shows us that 2020 probably had a pretty good broad wing year. Red tails for 2020 are definitely lower than our 20 year average. And as we've pointed out, red tails are going down. And I'll have another graphic for this. So I can use these type of illustrations when I'm writing these reports. There's too many sites, too many bird numbers, too many species to keep track of. So I always make graphics like this so that I can write the reports. I just advanced my slide and had to come back, but I think that got erased. So I'm just going to pick up here and redescribe the observation hours for our ridge sites. You'll notice that our ridge sites have uh, pretty consistent data in terms of observation hours. Year to year, it, we're certainly going to end up having uh, some weather squalls that will cause us to stay off the mountain uh, for a few days here or there. Overall, this data looks pretty consistent for our observation hours for our three sites. Our total birds appear to be going down at a steep uh, level, but I want to keep in mind, I want everyone to keep in mind that this was clearly a big year. Maybe we had a, a record broad wing hawk year in 2001 that would cause this to look like a steep uh, downward slope. So if we ignored that year, and we would have to keep that in you know, in the back of our mind when we're looking would cause that. Um, from there, we would see that the bouncing of the total birds up and down, it does go down slightly, but um, doesn't seem to be something of, uh, of great worry. Our black vultures and turkey vultures, again, these are difficult species to count. We know that uh, if there's a garbage dump nearby, these turkey vultures will end up swirling around, fly north and come back south in the same day. So uh, it's difficult to count this species. So uh, while the number of turkey vultures appears to be decreasing greatly, it might just be that we're not counting them. Bald eagles on the ridge sites is clearly rocketing up. And we could see this is the second best year Looks like 2017 was a better year. Um, but just like the rest of the Eastern Flyway, these eagle numbers are soaring, if you will. The golden eagles for the ridge sites appear to be fairly stable. Some years are high, some years are low. But in general, we can see our correlation coefficient uh, essentially says there's really no pattern here and there's really not a slope here. So um, we think that that's just going to be um, random fluctuations. Osprey numbers appear to be going down. Again, we've got this pretty big year from 2001. Northern Harrier, we are definitely concerned. Even if we take this big year into account, it does appear since 2004 that we have a downward trend here with a pretty strong correlation coefficient. Our Harriers, we're worried about. Broadwing Hawks appear to be fairly um, just random, bouncing up and down. And this value is essentially zero, which means um, it's going to come out as a decimal as 0 0.0002, so essentially zero. Our red tails, we are definitely concerned about our red tails, and they are going down in a uh, precipitous manner with an R squared value of 0.72. So red tails are a bird that we think are decreasing their migration. We're not totally sure about their population but it appears that they are um, decreasing their migration. Red shoulder hawks appear to be going down. Rough legged, we've already had a couple zeros here. Um, our uh, changing climate is probably responsible for this. Our sharp shinned hawks uh, for the ridge sites appear to be going down as are our Cooper's Hawks. And of course, we get some bigger years, but we haven't had a bigger year in uh, several years. Peregrine Falcons might be going up very slightly. We had two really good years, and this is probably from the Allegheny front, as we saw. Our Northern Goshawk was our first year of not 
recording a single northern goshawk. Um, it appears that they are uh, being extirpated, probably because of climate. Kestrels are uh, showing a downward trend also. We have a big year here again. Keep that in mind. Merlin look like they're doing okay. Now we can look at the individual sites. I make one of these graphics for one of these tables for every site um, along with a chart for every single site. It's the only way that I can try to find trends within particular sites. And if you look at the Allegheny Fronts data, and they're color-coded like our other schemes, we can see that um, in the last 20 years, we have a big year for our peregrine falcons, a 12. And we'll notice that kestrels are very, very low. Look at that, 21% of an average year. So we're concerned about our kestrels at the Allegheny Front. Golden Eagles, 89. That is actually 26% above our average, which would be 71 birds. Rough-legged, we used to get them a little bit more often, but the latest trends over the last six or seven years shows that we're not seeing the rough-legged. Our red tail clearly decreasing, and we're down at 144 for red tails. Not a record low, but close to it. And, of course, no northern goshawk, which we used to see at the, nor at the Allegheny Front. And our Cooper's hawks are also, notice, green slowly turning into red and some rather low numbers here. And uh, northern harrier are also showing uh, a significant decrease. Bald eagles, uh, a little bit lower than the last couple years, but um, that, that happens. Notice we had just five in 2018, so um, we're not concerned about our bald eagles. Our overall observation hours are about 9% less than a, an average year. This is just a different way of viewing that same information. Let's look at a Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in Kempton, Pennsylvania. Notice they have a record number of 301 observation hours for the spring. And while this is only going back 20 years, they go back a, f a couple more years at Hawk Mountain. And um, this is a record along with their turkey vultures and their broad wings. So they had a really great year, 301 observation hours. That's, that's a lot of observation hours for a place that's as cold as Hawk Mountain in the spring. Notice they didn't have a northern goshawk or a rough-legged. And um, their merlins are actually, eight's a pretty good number when their average is five. And their peregrines, they only average about two a year, and that's what they got this year. So uh, those are some of the highlights and lowlights for Hawk Mountain. Now, when we look at Tussie, Tussie's interesting in that um, sometimes you'll have a zero count for a bird. You know, we've seen this before here at Tussie. A zero here, a zero there, a zero here, a zero there, there, there. But this is the first year that we have zero for black vultures, zero for northern goshawk, zero for rough-legged, and zero for peregrine falcons. What does that mean? I'm not really sure. Maybe they didn't count black vultures this year, or maybe black vultures just didn't come along. Regardless, um, this is the first year where we have four zeros. But we did have a record number of bald eagles here with 91. That's an impressive record. Notice, that's 121% or 221% of an average year. So more than double the average for um, Tussie. Again, they didn't have a peregrine this year. Um, Merlins, we've talked about. Golden Eagles, down a little bit. Uh, Broadwing, about average, so 712 is average, 705 this year. And uh, we've already talked about turkey vultures. They appear to be low this year. But again, they're a, different, a difficult species to, um, to keep track of if they're migrating or not. But I wanted to point something out with Tussie here, uh, because this is a more interesting point. Um, notice that we have lots of dark green in 2001, record years in 2001, um, some spectacular numbers. And um, what could cause that? Well, 
And, and by the way, this would temper some of our, if we got rid of 2001 here, get rid of 2001, this big year, um, these percentages would, would not be so, um, uh, so large. Let's look for Merlins. Uh, they had 16 Merlin in 2001. And then they don't have anything remotely close to that. There's nine. So eight would be a really big year for Merlin at Tussie if it were not for this 2001. So 2001 got me thinking because I look at data, an awful lot of data all the time. And uh, I thought, I wonder what was special about that year. So I went to hotcount.org and I looked up 2001 and I just picked it uh, a month of April. And lo and behold, I can see that there is a maybe a good reason why the count was a little bit high this year. You know, at Hawk Sites, we've always wondered, does the counter matter if, if one counter versus another counter from year to year? Well, those of you that know this gentleman, Mike Lanzone, understand that he's like Magic Mike and he attracts birds. And he was the counter, along with his wife, Trish Miller, who... Uh, has her PhD essentially in raptor migration. So notice you have Mike who, it's not like folklore. I mean, it's true. If any of you have ever been birding with Mike, the birds are out when Mike's out. And uh, and he also sees birds that no one else sees. And you're like, oh, it's right there. How did I miss it? Mike doesn't miss any of those. And uh, I just want to point something out, else out here that... Um, you know, Trish, who's, a, you know, clearly a Golden Eagle expert, uh, has Mike by her side as the observer. And uh, I want to point out, I just looked at, went down a couple more slots. And then we have David Brandis, PhD. Um, those of you that know David, he is also a counter here with Mike Land's own. <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, he's got an engineering background and his research is really on the impacts of wind energy and golden eagles. And so his specialty is mathematical modeling for terrain updrafts of raptor migration. And Mike has a company that tracks the golden eagles with telemetry. These are people that are, their brains are literally keyed in on pattern making, especially with raptors. That might have something to do with uh, that, I call it the super year, the super 2000 year at Tussie. Um, I, I deal with uh, David with uh, uh, Mana, and he's a big part of RPI, so occasionally we'll have to converse about some RPI data. So, you know, something interesting that I thought, uh, that I thought the rest of you might get a kick out of. All right, so look, we've always said, does the counter matter? Um, I'm going to say yes if their names are Mike Lanzone, Trish Miller, and David Brandis, all working together. Um, that we, we can have a presentation on on counters and and how that might change the count, but um, having a little bit of fun there. All right, um, I've already gone for about 45 minutes, so we're going to kind of wrap this up. Um, this is mainly for the uh, the ridge sites. I'll make another one of these for the northeast sites and also the mid-Atlantic coast sites. But I hope this gives you a little bit more um, background on how the Eastern Flyway Report is written, how it comes about, the methodology, and so on. And if you would like more detailed information on your particular site, please e email me at wargo at humana.org because I probably have already crunched your data. I have it waiting there. Um, so, and if I can help you with anything, please let me know. And uh, thanks for sitting through this. And if uh, you're interested in hearing more about your site, just let me know. All right. Thank you.